Welcome friends to this short afternoon session. I spoke to you in the morning about the nature of creation and the creator. The ultimate totality of consciousness, one unit, you can give it any name you like. You can call it God, Creator, Allah, Elishwar, Parmeshwar, Zeus, whatever name you want to call, it's a name. But the creative power is the same. But when religions speak of the creative power, they are not speaking of that power. They want to personify even the creator. They don't want to say creator is totality. They want to say the creator is everything. They want to say God is love. They want to say those things. But they want to personify and therefore when you have these different levels of experiences, we have gods who are being worshipped by religion. It's important to know that when people can pray to a god and even say our saviour sits next to, next to the god, they are talking of something in time and space and talking of a being, not consciousness totality, of a being who sits there. You will notice that this world, physical world, is governed by government. And the governments are headed by some individuals. We may call them presidents of the country, we may call them prime ministers, we may call them kings, queens, rulers. It doesn't matter. But this physical world and physical universe is being governed by somebody. Similarly, the astral worlds are also being governed by beings. And they are being worshipped as gods. When we personify, we limit ourselves to that level. Therefore, we limit ourselves to our own salvation, to our own enlightenment, to our own discovery of the truth, to heavens and hells and things like that, which are all in time and space. And they all exist at the astral plane at the very plane of consciousness where you first go when you withdraw your attention from the body. So those beings are also running those universes and in turn also creating and running this universe. Therefore, in a way, it's appropriate to call them the creator of this universe. Therefore, religions worship them and they give it different names. It's a personified God who is a being who sits there. When you go with a perfect living master in your own inner experience, you can request him. May I look at God or the uh, Allah that is talking of or the uh, Zeus or whoever I was talking of. Can I go and see him? I will show you. And you see the same being is being called by all these different names here. Very interesting that we are thinking that's the final creative power. And we are limiting it to something that is still in time and space, still gen the only difference is they don't have matter. They have perception, they have sense perceptions, they function like beings, like we function there as beings. So when we say God, who are we referring to? We are referring to the creative power, are we referring to higher people who have practiced meditation and gone to the universal mind? have considered that as the ultimate creative power. Because all that can be known here in time and space is from there. So if your whole concept of creation is time and space, that is the creative power, the causal plane. And there is a being there who can also be worshipped as the highest God. I have reached the highest God who causes everything, including the God who runs the universes. People can say that. When you go beyond that and discover that the real creative power is not a being but totality of consciousness. What is totality? Totality does not mean 
is something sitting separate from us. If we are separate, that's not total. We are part of it even now. This creation we are talking about is taking place in totality, not outside. Therefore, somebody who has had the experience of totality of consciousness discovers that all the levels of creation were all taking place right there. There is no other place. And that's not a place either. It's just power, creative power. Where everything is there. We are merely experiencing something within that totality, not outside. Somebody asked me, where I go to my true home, what about the guys left behind? I said, sorry, nothing will be left behind. You will take all the creation with you. They can't understand this. If I am going on my journey, how can I take the creation with me? Because you are not what you think you are. You are not an individual at all. You have created individuation and individuality. You have experience of the many. That's all. So that is why it is indescribable what totality is. There is no way we can understand it with the mind. But I can tell you one thing. If you have that experience, you are simultaneously having the experience of every level of creation. We can't do that in any other place. When we are here and meditate, we have to leave this awareness. We have to withdraw our attention from the physical world and from a physical presence to go to the next level. When we leave that, we have to leave the awareness of that presence. So we are neither aware of the astral self nor of the physical self. We are in causal plane. When we are in a dream state at night, we have to leave the awareness of the wakeful state. All these states of being, right up to the universal mind, require that you live in only one reality and make everything else look unreal. Right now, dreams look unreal. When you're dreaming, they don't look unreal. And if somebody says, there's a wakeful state, they say, aren't we awake? What's a wakeful state? Sometimes people find out that they are dreaming in a dream. Many of I have had dreams like that, where I knew I'm, a, I'm dreaming. I say, where am I dreaming? I have to run and find my body. I'm still believing that the one that's going to run to find the body is me. When I wake up, that was not real at all. It's just being made up within myself. There was no outside space where dream took place. It took place in the same space which is sitting, sitting in my head. Same thing happens. That is why at one time we can only experience one reality. But at totality, you experience all realities. What is the implication? The perfect living masters who are operating from totality of consciousness while human beings, they are constantly 24-7 aware of all levels of consciousness. They know all are created and not real. They all know they have been converted into reality. So when, I, when we meet a perfect living master, he looks like an ordinary person to us. He is an ordinary person as a person. Born like us, lives like us, has karma like us, sits on the time frame like us, no difference at all. As a body, as a mind, as a one carrying karma, no difference. He's just another human being like ourselves. The only difference is his awareness. What is he aware of? And he is aware of all levels at the same time, 24 7. This is very different from some people who have experiences. They had a strange experience. They come back and tell us what their experience is. When they tell us, they are not in that experience. They are remembering something and sharing with us. But when a perfect living master speaks to us, he is speaking directly from knowing what he is speaking about. That is why you will never find, when you hear these perfect living masters, you will never find any maybes and perhapses in their talk. Because maybes and perhapses come when you are not sure, you are just trying to make some guesswork. They speak with certainty. When I was going through the Bible, 
and I read about Jesus Christ Sermon on the Mount, a very important sermon. At the end of it, it says, when he sp stopped speaking, there was a hush upon the multitude, for he spake like one with authority and not like the scribes. That's the difference. When perfect living masters speak, they speak with authority, they are speaking directly from what they are experiencing, not from what they remembered, what they saw. Big difference. And that is why we are very affected by even their presence, because in their presence, they are having all awarenesses. But they will behave exactly like us, according to their karma, according to their role on this. And I must say they are good actors. They have to be good actors. If in spite of the awareness, they can still maintain their role in whatever state they are. And by the way, we might think these human beings that we see here and call them perfect living masters are just with some higher knowledge or something helping us. They are helping souls in the astral plane. They are helping souls in the causal plane. They are helping some souls in the spiritual planes who are still in a state of individuation, but not into a totality. Even after discovering our true nature, that we are a unit of consciousness, that we are part of the Creator, that we were never separated from the Creator, just by experience we are separated. Even after discovering that, we still are in a state of separation from total. Even when the soul discovers, I'm the soul, I'm immortal, I was never born, will never die. Still, it's the individuation, cover of individuation, not totality. There are many masters who have reached that state. And we distinguish them in the North India, I know, by calling those Sad Gurus and Sat Gurus, those who have reached totality. So we use these two terms just to show that even after discovering the truth about your immortality, even discovering the soul, you have not discovered totality. And that part from soul, totality, not possible except when the consciousness is from total, total consciousness. Therefore, we need perfect living masters for that level. Do we need masters at all? If the whole thing is inside us, why do we need a master? People ask me this question. If God is inside me, I have to find God. But I don't need an agent outside called a guru or a master outside. I can find myself inside. Nobody is found inside. Because our whole concept of what is inside is to close your eyes and think you are inside. Closing eyes doesn't take you inside, you are still outside. You are what we are looking at, you can't see, you close your eyes. Closing eyes does not give you any knowledge whatsoever about the inside. And we say, okay, I have not only closed my eyes, I am now chanting some nice mantras. I am now chanting special simran and special words given by a master, by a guru. Therefore, now I am inside. Not at all. You are chanting words which you can speak with the tongue. Most of the time we are chanting with the tongue. People are actually moving their tongue. They don't move too much. They can feel they are talking the same way. Okay, I am more advanced now. I am now meditating with my mind. I am chanting with your mind and the mind is thinking of 20 other things. Chanting is going on in one level. Mind is commenting, okay, this is not this slow, do it a little faster. Okay. Who is that? Who is that speaking inside us? That is in control, not the chanters. Not easy. Not easy to know what is inside. And that is why it's the perfect living master's image that comes inside. Sometimes referred to as the radiant form of the master. You have to have the radiant form of the master to experience inside rain. Otherwise, you are, some people say, I could see light. I saw colors. Do you know what I tell them? I hit you on the head, you'll see them. You knock on the head, you see colors and light. What is this? Is that spirituality? 
is that knowledge. Knowledge is to discover who you are. And therefore, it's not easy. Perfect living masters, when they accept us as their friend, they do not operate from outside. They operate from inside. It's their pull that takes us inside. The same, we feel little pull outside, and when we try to go in, more pull inside. But they say you must reach a certain point which is available to all of us. Point at which we are operating from as conscious units in a physical body, third eye center. That's all they require us to do because they are, we can't see them. They, we see them in physical form for a little while. We hear them once. We want to spend more time. They don't have time. Number of people that beat them is a lot. We, our turn comes. So we don't have that time outside. So they say, come inside where you have all the time. Whenever you like. That is left to us to work out. Great master used to give the example that we have to come to the railroad station. Masters are waiting with tickets to go any destination. But our problem is going to the railroad station. The big journey is ahead. And we can't even reach there. So many obstacles are on the way. No, what about I have to take care of my family, take care of my job, I have to take care of so many things. All created things outside are keeping us away from going to the railroad station. More recently, Master started saying, come to the airport and we'll fly. The airport is third eye center. Go to the point where you can feel the presence of your master, that he is there and visibly there. People have wrongly identified the term radiant form of master. Nuri Sarup, they call it in Hindi. That impression given is master shines with light inside. And so I've seen some pictures being drawn. I remember an artist making the radiant for master. And light was coming out of him. From the feet it was flowing down. Like a little stream of light. Totally wrong image. Why it's called radiant form of master is that it can be seen even in utter darkness. Therefore they call it radiant. Something that can be seen in utter darkness. We have watches, radium watches. And we can see them in the darkness. So therefore we call they are radiant. Therefore, what you can see in utter darkness is radiant. When you say you can see radiant form of the master inside, you are also radiant. You close your eyes completely in a completely dark room. And you imagine you are sitting behind, you can see anything. The power of imagination, which is merely the use of sense perceptions without these eyes, without these hands, without these ears. The power of imagination enables you to see anything you like in darkness. So when you can see something in outside darkness and even inside darkness, that's called the radiant form. So the master appears in radiant form, which means it's visible. But don't Think I've seen the master, but I didn't see the radiant form. People tell me that. So that is the radiant form that you are seeing. Okay, they don't know how to see the radiant form. I give simple recipe for that. First of all, you must see the master in physical form. If you haven't seen physical form, forget about radiant form. Whatever form you'll make is your mind's imagination, not real. You must see the master in physical form. Having seen him in physical form, remember what he looked like when you saw him physically. Remember. Remember means put that image in memory. When you meditate, you meditate by remembering your master as you saw him. That's the beginning of the radiant form. When you start remembering your master, 
master might have just been say we saw the master walking and we remember we close our eyes and remember master walking we can still see him walking by memory when we see him walking and applying a little filter to make sure it's not a mind's image but really you are remembering the master master gives us some words of protection the mantra that he gives are more or less not so much for concentrating attention more to prevent the mind from making up the image if you are repeating that and see the master walking as you saw him and why he is walking in the memory he suddenly turns around he did not turn around when he was walking outside inside he suddenly turned around and you are surprised a radiant form of master if you practice this you can see that in the beginning you only see him and he disappears sometime appear disappear because of memory we are starting with memory from the actual face we have seen that face stabilizes and then the master speaks we apply the same rule that it's not our mind speaking and have a conversation with the master once this becomes a regular event for you you are having contact with the master 24/7 this is so different from any other yoga that i have practiced or any other method of meditation i have practiced none of them say that the master will be with you but this method taught by great master means master is with you at the starting point inside all you have to do is to reach that point so it is basic meditation you have to do the rest then you go together with a friend master's presence will be felt inside in meditation then you will be so used to this experience that you will remember master all the time and he'll appear eyes open not meditating he'll appear because you're remembering even with your eyes open if you want to remember a friend you can remember the picture comes with practice master's image will be there and will be like he is where you want him to be for example you'll be driving your car he could be sitting next to you you open your eyes here he is you are never alone i have found the very best cure for loneliness is to develop the relationship with the master inside and inside will be outside also it's a remarkable experience nobody will ever feel lonely after such an experience and a friend is there with you all the time guiding there are so many situations that come in life when we don't know what to do we can't run to the physical form of the master to find out it's too late to contact by any other means but if you have that experience you have guidance 24/7 with you changes your whole life here this is not merely an exploration of yourself is to change your life right here and make it totally different two or three things happen if you practice this kind of meditation and are lucky to be ready for acceptance by your master who appears in your life that's the big point when you are ready and the master comes accepts you friend have come we'll go home together that's it luckiest thing that can happen in our entire existence when that happens after that you have a companion a friend with you all the time you can't feel lonely you enjoy everything together you enjoy inside together you enjoy outside together it's an amazing experience life changes moreover by being with the master inside it becomes automatic for you to look upon life as a drama and you know even your body is a character today it's very difficult to even assume i am just a character i am real me sitting inside it's very difficult even to imagine but that become natural so therefore 
the highs and lows of the drama, the good things and bad things that happen in life, they look so normal, like any show, any drama. The drama of life. Human life has been created with ups and downs. Nobody is having all ups and all downs. I have not met anybody like that. On the whole globe, everybody is having ups and downs. Sometimes good times, they laugh and joke and happy. Sometimes they are crying and suffering. This suffering and pleasure go together. Why, why should that be? Because this physical existence in human life is designed like that and there are other places in existence, other places in creation where you can have extremes. You are extremely good person and want to be happy all the time, done all good karma, you won't be here, you will be in heaven, in the astral plane. You done all bad things, you won't be here, you will be in hell, in the astral plane. There are the places designed for that. It's only when you have a mixture of high and low, we become human beings. So that is why human life has ups and downs. Now, if you are a witness to the drama, and the drama has all ups, you'll walk out. Too bold. All down, you'll walk out. You're interested in the drama, which has high and low, tragic and comic situations. So that is why this drama in which we are all acting, we are acting so realistically to make it real that we have forgotten we are uh, merely actors and we have forgotten where we are watching the drama from. After initiation and being with the, with the master inside, you always remember it's a drama. Attitude changes. Your downs look very different than they look when you are actually thinking you are suffering. Imagine having this knowledge and awareness at all times. You are a soul, unaffected by any karma. No karma has ever touched any soul. And you are holding a mind which generates karma and holds on as karma creating good and bad, high and low. And you are using the mind to experience good and bad, high and low. You are just using an equipment to see good and bad. You are not good and bad, you are above that. The soul is above that. And you are now watching from the spiritual point of view, the whole attitude changes. And that is reflected in your daily life right here. That is why People say that man doesn't seem to be affected by this or that, neither high nor low. Why is that? That's an important thing, that if you want to have only the peripheral benefits, I call this peripheral benefits, just the benefit of how you are living in this life, it changes by this kind of meditation. It's an amazing thing that these things can happen with some small doses of meditation. Not go very deep, one step only one level up to these sensory systems in the imaginary state. All you have to do is that imagine you are behind the eyes. Imagine that the whole of you, which you think is the body outside, has moved. That you have picked up your whole body and taken it into your head. And once you have taken to the head, head is small, you are big. The problem. Somebody wrote to me yesterday, I took my body into my head, but half of it was outside. <laughs> this space was too little. But when you want to imagine you are there with your eyes closed, not with your eyes open, with your eyes closed, do you see the space which is darkness inside is much bigger than your head? When you place the whole of yourself, you are placing yourself in the darkness that is there because your eyes are shut and that space is enough to accommodate not only your whole self, but if you look around the whole universe. You can see, I can say it's like a big room I'm in. Imagination, big room, right? I am putting curtains on the right side, far away. 
It's all happening in the head. So we don't have to stay in the physical head all the time. Only the first step. Only first step that you feel that you are not on the chair, but you moved up into the head. After that, the space is automatically opening up. And the whole of you fits in there. With your imagination, stay there. Do everything there. In the wakeful state. Don't go to sleep. Then it won't work. Tendency to sleep will be great. I want to just caution you that we sleep because we need sleep. We need that kind of rest for the physical body and for our thoughts to go into a different life stream. Many reasons for sleep, but sleep has become essential for us. And when we sleep, we lose the third eye center. We move down, as I said earlier, in the morning. And therefore, only in the wakeful state, as a human wakeful person, preferably sitting upright, because that's where we are most awake. When we lie down, then the sleep is much, much more. But even while we are sitting up, when we try to move our attention away from the body, the tendency to slip is there. And many people go to sleep trying to meditate. I must confess, once I was doing a meditation workshop with some friends in Wisconsin, and I was telling them how to close your eyes and meditate. I must be tired that day, because in a little while I felt I was snoring. Most people cannot hear their snoring because they go to deep sleep. And snoring is a sign that you are deep sleep, therefore you cannot hear your snoring. Somehow I can hear my snoring. I felt I was snoring. I opened my eyes, everybody is staring. <laughs> I had gone to sleep myself and tried to demonstrate. But I to save my face. I told my friends, this was a demonstration. <laughs> Even I will try to meditate and go to sleep. Anyway, the tendency to sleep is strong. There have been mystics, pastors, whom I know, who were so conscious of this fact that they can go to sleep. My own master, Baba Savan Singh's own master, Baba Jabal Singh, when he was a student on this, as a disciple of his master, he was so conscious that sleep will overcome that he had a hook on the on the roof of his little hut that he was there, the little cabin he had made for meditation, and he hung a rope and tied his hair with that. So when the sleep would come, he'd wake up. And I know other masters who took very cold, bitter cold, ice cold shower, they won't sleep. It's a natural tendency that sleep will come, be careful. But even when you withdraw your attention and it's a regular good meditation, new experiences will start. And those experiences will sharpen your sense perceptions. You see things so clearly you haven't seen with the physical eyes. You will hear things so clearly. Small sound at a distance will be heard. So you will know your sense perceptions have gone higher. In lower state, sleep, they go lower. In that higher state, they go higher. When that happens, you will know this is real. And you will say it's real. Then what will happen? You will end your meditation session back in the body. Was that real or was it a dream? You still say that. Because there's no way for you. It looked real. But now this looks real. So which one is real? So that is why many people have had experiences. They have an experience they can't make out later on. Was it a dream? Or was it a real higher experience? Because now we are back to this reality. The other reality looks unreal. Until you are at the top, it will always happen like this that you will have one level of reality as the only reality at that time. 
Other you have to explain to yourself for that. Remember this part also. But I'll tell you the difference between an astral experience and a dream experience. In dreams, normal dreams, the images that come are monocolored, buff colored. They are the color of the dream is generated by the color of our skin from through which the light passes. The skin's color, buff colored or little darker or lighter is generally the color on which you see in several images. If you carefully watch, most dreams are like that and most of them are forgotten within 30 seconds of waking up. You don't get a chance to remember many. But some experiences are taking place at the astral level in which you see colors which do not occur in the normal dreams and those are blue color, yellow color, they don't normally occur. Red color and buff color are common. But the blue and yellow color, if somebody sees a beautiful blue sky, say, I had a very vivid dream, lucid dream, I saw this. It's not coming from the lower dream, it's coming from inner experience. We all have many experiences. We have been seeking, we have been doing some exercises for many lifetimes. And many of those experiences come up because of that work we have done in the past. We are not aware of it. So these experiences, when they come, you can always relate to experience from the nature of the experience. And that is why when we have these experiences, don't always believe that you can bring all of it into your wakeful memory. Some will disappear, like the dream experiences disappear, some will stay. The most magnificent experiences will stay. Like the most uh, traumatic experience in dreams, we still remember. Or something exceptionally good, we remember, other than we forget. Similarly, the higher experiences function the same way. These are just some little tips I am giving you because we may not sometimes be sure of what is happening. With practice, you get to know exactly what is happening. And if you move on further to more than one step of reality, it becomes very certain to know the astral plane. If you go to causal plane, that pull your attention within the, uh, the astral body. What we think is an imaginary body. When we think we are sitting in, in the head, we are imagining we are sitting there. So we think this is a real body. That's imaginary body. But the imaginary body is doing a lot of things. And it can also do meditation. Like we are doing meditation with this body, why not with the imaginary body in the imaginary head? When you do that, and you move inside the imaginary head of the inner body, then you will always remember the astral plane. So two steps are necessary for remembering that. One step is necessary for remembering the physical reality, and we come back all the time to physical reality. Why is it necessary to be a human being to get this experience? What about angels? flying about in the astral plane. What about souls in heavens? Why can't they do it? They can't do it because they cannot become seekers. They are knowers. They know what is arranged. They know the means by which we predetermine the script of life. We don't know. Here, ignorance of the future is a great benefit to us. If we found out our future for certainty, we'll never be seekers. Seeking is possible when you can't see. You won't seek otherwise. This physical form is the only form where because of our ignorance of the future, we feel we can make decisions what to do in the future. We cannot imagine that something we are deciding today has been pre-scripted earlier. Somebody says, it's pre-scripted what you will do tomorrow morning. Okay, let me judge. 
Prescripted says I'll go west. Okay, I'll break the prescription. I go east. Then you go there and see the script. Script says you will stay. Who says prescripted? I will go east. It says west. All the thought process prescripted. Events are not prescripted. Thoughts are prescripted. The manner in which we make our decisions are prescripted and can be seen in the causal plane. Now, when you are in those levels, the knowledge that comes up prevents you from becoming a seeker. You have to be at this physical level, not having knowing what the future is particularly, and even forgetting most of the past, and certainly forgetting everything about the past that is not in this body. So once we are in that confined state of awareness, we can become seekers. So that is why this unique opportunity to find the key and go in is only available in human life. Not in animal life. Not in life of birds and mammals and insects and trees. They are all living according to a prescripted destiny. But they don't make decisions. They don't have choices. Only human beings are offered choices. This or that. And it is not that you have to make situations for choice. The choices will come anyway in your life. Therefore, when alternatives appear before you, this or that, you have to make a choice. When you make a choice, you think it's your decision at that time. You could have chosen either alternative. With this ignorance, we have no idea that the way the mind decides to choose something is prescripted. The thought process that goes into making decisions, that's what prescripted at the causal plane. And you can go there and check it out. I'm very happy again to spend a little time with you and we'll meet again next month.